Thanks, Greg. <clears throat> and thanks for that introduction. So tonight's presentation, modal shift. It's all about Highland Spring. It's all about moving product differently. Uh, so for the past six years, I've been involved in what we would call a local project compared to my normal day to day. It's not, uh, it's not in the Middle East, it's not in the UK. <laughs> it's in Scotland. Yes, it is in the UK. Uh, so what we've been doing is creating the infrastructure needed to move the bottled water from the Island Spring facility at Blackboard. Instead of moving it by road, moving it by rail. So the new facility, uh, this is Highland Springs uh, main works here at Blackford, sleepy little village of Blackford. This is the Tully Bardeen distillery here. I can recommend that for a visit. Uh, the Highland Spring water production plant is in here. So in this aerial image, the Highland Spring site appears to be well connected to both road and rail transport network because we've got the A9 dual carriageway here, we've got the Glasgow Rail Perth line here, and we've got a former rail sign stuck in there. That's, you know, walking distance. The sustainability arguments for moving product from Highland Spring, and they ship a lot of the stuff, and I guess everybody on the call has sampled their product. And you think, well, where does that ball come from? How did it get here? When I was talking about this to some students at Glasgow Cali Uni, and I said, well, there was a guy with a bottle in the water in these desks. I says, how do you think that got there? And he said, well, that's easy. I bought it at Tesco. OK, right, OK, but it still has to get to the Tesco. So this is where it's made. And normally it goes by road. So the modal shift idea is to get from road to real transport. And what's that all about? It's all about sustainability, sustainability arguments, as most people are aware these days, because it's, there's a big focus on it is moving things by rail is a lot more environmentally friendly and sustainable than it is moving by dirty HGV diesel lorries. So the facility would offer long-term benefits in moving, removing HGV lorry loads and thousands of tonnes of uh, embodied carbon, carbon exhaust fumes and all the rest of it from uh, the roads. So modal shift from road to rail transport is well supported by the, sorry, could you please mute your microphones? That scares the living daylights out of me. <clears throat> modal shift from road to rail transport is well supported by the government, government in general, Scottish government in particular, under the modal shift revenue support scheme, which obviously attracts an acronym called the MSRS. MSRS is designed to facilitate support that modal shift in transport from road to rail to generate environmental and wider social benefits from reductions in HGV lorry loads in Britain's roads. In addition to MSRS, any company that wants to move freight by rail rather than by road and which is proposing to invest in a new or reinvest in an existing freight handling facility in Scotland can apply for a Freight Facilities Grant, an FFG. Everybody really likes an acronym. I used to think it was an FFS. Grants are normally limited to a maximum of 50% of the capital expenditure. So if you think about it, do your sums, you could get half it back. So all that sounds very simple. And for Highland Springs position here, next to the main line, it sounds like a doddle to do. However, being close to a railway, and even one with an existing siding, isn't always close enough. The railway siding at Blackford, as I said, was a former siding. It was closed to rate traffic years ago when transfer of local dairy products and the like livestock and such to the Perth market moved to a more flexible mode of transport. They stuck on lorries. A single siding was retained on either side of the main line at Blackford to act as a refuge for slower rail traffic. So for refuge, think of passing place. These refuge sidings are little used these days because of the size of them, and eventually they've fallen into disuse. Meanwhile, the volume of HGV lorries passing through Blackford Village, and that's, you know, on this route here, couldn't be ignored. 
they're causing a considerable impact on the local road infrastructure and on the community. There was a local residence committee <laughs> who are quite vociferous in their opposition to HGV lorries and especially the speed they go through the village at. The main road through the village is straight. Dog drivers, when they see straight roads, tend to do what they do in straight roads. So the local campaign groups raised safety concerns about traffic speeds, and they were worried in particular about accidents at the sharp left turn into the Highland Spring factory, just about here, which just happened to be next to the local primary school. So folks were worried about their kids, folks were worried about lorry speeds. As far as everybody's concerned, it's an accident in black spot waiting to happen. And even though the southbound exit for Blackfoot to the A9 dual carriageway coming out here isn't fit for HGVs because you have to move on to the central reservation, loaded HGVs come out of the factory, they turn right, they go across the level cross and they follow this red route all the way up here, they join the A9, they head northbound for a little bit, then they go off the A9, up over the top and back down, they come all the way back down southbound again, do they get to where they think they should have been if they travelled back down through the village? So, something had to be done to respond to local residents' fears. Highland Spring looked at this and in 2012, so 2012, Highland Spring recognised that the level of road transport journeys to support their current uh, throughput and the future level of production in their, that they predict in their business plan would kind of need an alternative solution because let's just say their relationship with the local community was wearing a bit thin. Key aspects of change were identified early and they were a good fit with the available funding. Uh, the case was made that road safety improvements so the reduction in number of vehicles would help local environmental benefits from reduced emissions and wider environmental benefits for the reduced emissions and that reduction in carbon footprint in the distribution cycle was to be welcomed and that's what the various grants were set up to do. 2012. The project took 10 years to develop to get from that initial idea in 2012 that what we want to do is move stuff by rail instead of road. But it was a key part of Highland Springs long-term business strategy and Fair play to Highland Spring, they stuck at it because they said, no, our idea is to produce a product which people will want to purchase, to drink. It's all about hydration. It's all about the you know human uh, elements involved in it. And they were interested in making sure that they could sell the case to say, our product has environmental sustainability at its heart. So in 2016, WSP were commissioned to explore the feasibility of constructing this new freight facility to connect the factory to the main Glasgow Perth rail route, which was nearby. So in the image here, this is the main works, the plant in there, and that's all the HGVs stacked up ready to go. This is Blackford signal box, picture taken from Blackford level crossing. Initial concept included a container transfer facility with an initial layer that could be future proof. Now, the future proofing of it was key to the expansion of Highland Spring. It would be nonsense for Highland Spring to identify a facility that would only handle their current levels of production. How would they expand in the future? As a business, they had to consider where the business was going to go. Their business forecast a doubling of the daily output from 40 TEUs within five years of rail traffic beginning. If you've never heard of a TEU, you've seen lots of them. A TEU is the acronym for a 20-foot equivalent unit. It's a container. It's a standard unit of measurement used to determine cargo capacity for container ships, terminals, and therefore when we were designing the facility, we said, what's your initial capacity? And the initial capacity, Highland Spring said, well, we need to be able to unload 20 40-foot containers per day and 40 40-foot containers a day from five, year five. 
So the 40 foot container is a two TEU container. Just in case we get things missed later on. I'm going to talk from now on about 40 foot containers because that's the standard size that you see on a lorry or on a train. They do smaller ones, they make up two 20 foots, stick on the same train, it occupies the same area as a 40 foot and you can travel them. But in terms of the containers, Highland Springs business revolved around putting pallets of material on a 40 foot containers. So the former sidings at Blackbird was the obvious choice for development. There was a siding there before. All we had to do was develop it, extend it a bit, job done. It had just about enough length to allow a single train every day with 20 empty 40 foot containers on board to be offloaded, loaded with full containers with a minimum of shunt and fuss. And with the appropriate track layout, we could uh, double that up within five years without doing too much uh, work that would be abortive. We needed to have a temporary stockpile for up to 20 40 foot containers to speed up the operations. One of the planning constraints that was placed on the site was not after the hours of darkness, so it's a kind of 6 till 2200 type operation. So they needed a temporary stockpile to make sure that the containers that were coming from here on a little shuttle service over into the facility could be stacked up, ready to go. Similarly, the train could be unloaded and while the little shop thing was running backwards and forwards, the excess could be stacked neatly at the side, ready for the next lift onto the shuttle bus. So initially moving bottled water products from pallets loaded onto HGVs with curtain sides um, wasn't a big concern for Island Spring, it was just a different way of uh, meeting the product. And that was a, a very simple thing for the, them to build into their business plan. That sounding simple thing went like this. <laughs> we had some mainline access issues. So the mainline access was the first hurdle to be overcome. It was quickly discovered when we got into this project properly that the existing crossover, and that's it uh, in yellow there, that's a crossover, and then the connection into the siding, were secured out of use. They're secure and things out of use is no big deal. If they're not being used, why wouldn't you? Never real secure switches out of use all the time for things like this that are never used. But the reason they were secured out of use was because they didn't really work very well. So rather than keep them working and keep them going out of use, they were just secured at use and that was a safe way of dealing with it. But never real's commitment to maintain the asset in good work and order was something that they inherited when they took over from Rail Track, which took over from British Rail. And unless you do a network change, you have to keep the asset in good work and order so that somebody that wants to start a new freight service is presented with what's in the sectional appendix and they say, well, there's a, a siding there ready to go. Unfortunately, the ability to restore the layout functionality was hampered because the signal box here at Blackbird operating these points here and here uh, is connected by mechanical rodding and the rodding ran under the level crossing. And guess what? The HGVs that got over the level crossing, there's a couple ready, ready to go, um, were causing problems by the weight of them uh, pressing down on the mechanical rodding and making sure that it wasn't in good working order. As well as that, Neverrail also had aspirations for the future use of this site. They had this imagination that one day the line beyond the lane would be electrified. And that future vision included an electrified passing loop. So this line in here would be extended, it'd become a passing loop, it'd be electrified, and that would allow one train to bypass another, no problem. And they said, if you're going to develop this area in here, we need to ring fence some of that land to allow this passing loop in the future, an electrified passing loop. And that put quite a big constraint on the project, because although it looks fairly wide at this end, the siding narrows as it goes further west. 
But in addition to that length and width constraint, the site layout wasn't really ideal for train operations either, due to the orientation of these switches. Entry and exit is fairly simple from the north, it involves this connection here. Trains coming from the south have to go across the level crossing, wait, change the points, be signaled properly and safely back through the crossover and into the sidings as a propelling move. Propelling moves are not, um, not banned, not prohibited. They need to be carefully controlled, however. And there is a risk involved in a propelling move that the person in charge of the movement, the driver pushing the train back, might not know that one of the vehicles has derailed and keep on pushing. So propelling moves are generally discouraged, so you can have a propelling move if it's absolutely necessary. But if you can avoid a propelling move, please do so because of that increased risk. But that wasn't all. There was a core path issue at the site. And the core path issue was that the user operated pedestrian crossing. This was called Panholes Pedestrian Crossing. It's shown there in the in the image. So that allowed people from the village on this side to walk across the track to this area in here. There's one of them, Dog Walker. And Mr. Dog Walker with his dog would access that across the track early hours of the morning, allowed the dog to do what dogs do. Um, run about mad on the hill um, and then go walk back having exercised his dog. So this type of crossing, there's lots of them in the UK, and they're fairly common. They allow the pedestrians and the dog walkers access to the land on the other side of the railway. As a recognised core path, this route would need to be accommodated in our design of the any siding facility since you can't just close these things without providing a suitable alternative. OK, so the length of the site. Site's capacity had been established as the 40 TEUs. The overall length of the site needed to be determined. And to determine how long the trains are going to be, we need to calculate what type of wagons are going in. Now, there's kind of two wagons that fit the bill. The first one here I'm showing is an IKA. It's called a mega freight. So we need to allow for the 10 wagons with the four containers in each wagon, the 40 TEUs every day, plus the locomotive, and that comes out at that. So 10 of those, very simply, 364.4 metres long. Dead simple. The other one is the FKA, same type of uh, double coupled wagon. And uh, that's slightly longer. Uh, 377.2 metres long. And then you've got the length of a class 66 or whatever we're going to haul it these days, take it up to just under 400 metres. And we had to allow for a siding that would accommodate a 400 metre vehicle. And that's important because you have to get the vehicle in off the main line and you have to take the local off one end, run it round and stick it on the other end. And then once you've got that train in, how are you going to handle what's on it? There are different ways to do it. Transfer and shipping containers typically uses one of two methods, reach stacker vehicles or overhead gantry cranes. Reach stackers are very manoeuvrable things, but they still require a fair distance between the siding here, uh, where you're going to have a stockpile or vehicles coming in ready to accept them because they generally work at right angles to the vehicle. So right angles to the track, right angles to the vehicle. So that vehicle there will spin round 180, pick up another container and drop it on another lorry. They are good for what they do. And in certain situations, if you're not being pushed for room, then they're ideal. More expensive, but with significantly less space requirements and ideal for narrow sites, the overhead gantry crane offers a reduced load and offload time and increases the capacity of what you're trying to do. To address local resident concerns over noise and vibration, and bear in mind reach stackers, typically they are diesel engine vehicles, although you can get electric powered ones, 
Um, a rubber tired, electrically powered gantry crane was determined to offer the best solution. So being rubber tired and electrical powered means it's fairly silent. And days gone by before technology evolved this beast, it would have been mounted on crane rails either side. So you would have a rail here. These wheels would be not rubber tired, but rail wheels. And you'd have the same on this side. And that would guide it up and down as it traveled along the train, lifting containers off and stacking them. The other thing that we decided to appease local residents concerned because this great big orangey red thing would kind of, yes, stand out like a sore thumb at that height above the railway line. So we agreed if we set on the gantry crane, we're going to paint it green. And it was painted green. And just to use as part of the stakeholder consultation, this photo mock-up, so this is not an actual picture, the, sorry, that bit is, this bit is an artist's impression of what it would look like. So here's all the containers stacked, siding in here, main line here, big green overhead line gantry crane, and that idea was presented to the local residents, said, what do you think about that? And they said, actually, we quite like that. If we got to have something, and bear in mind, you are making the argument about local jobs and you're making the argument about sustainability and how it fits in the environment and all the rest of the things that people will get upset about when it's in their own backyard. So that photo overlay was produced to demonstrate the concept and that helped us with the planning submission to Perth and Kinross Council, the local council. So at this stage, February 2017, uh, rail access to and from the site was still based on using the existing track layout, but a few minor alterations. And to demonstrate the operational concept, we did a series of simple graphics. I did them on Excel to demonstrate the various train movements needed to unload the train. Um, I guess it would probably be done a bit slicker these days, but these little Excel graphs uh, were really good at showing how the train would move propel through the crossover half connection into the siding, how we do a run round. And in these sketches, you'll notice we've left an extra space here for this electrified loop in here that Network Rail wanted at the time to accommodate their future electrification plans. So the crane loading pad, you'll note here, that's the big blue blobs, is much shorter than the overall length of the train. It doesn't need to span the full length of the train because you can reposition the train using the locomotive. You can pull the logo into the head shunt and that allows access to the wagons at the back of the train. Then you can push it up the other way and pull it forward and do all sorts of things. Eventually that becomes the rounding move, the local couples off, uses that, goes on to that end, and then will propel back out onto the up main line and head south again. So these little diagrams were used to, produce, to go over the concepts and talk about number of wagons and how the movements would happen. And that's before we reached for the design tools to start talking about switches, crossings and layouts and all the rest of it. We have to prove that the concept works and it fits with network rail aspirations and the like. So what did it look like as a design? So this is the existing layout, that's the existing crossover. And that was the existing half connection into what was a piece of unused track, which would become the future electrified line. So our design sidings had been pushed south, all the way south this way, to allow for this uh, access, this mainline loop, electrified loop. And that was having an impact on how much storage we had, maybe not at this end of the site, but where the crane pad was at the narrow end of the site, we weren't getting the right number of containers in the answer. So this was a cross section we developed uh, in our discussions with Network Rail about basically steel in millimetres. We dimensioned these on the minimums that are allowed in design manuals, and that only gave us with the electrified loop, so that's the main line here and here, this is the electrified loop here. This only gave us two sidings, access for road vehicles, and it only gave us a two by two 
storage of containers. And actually, we were looking at something that looked a bit more like three by two. So after a lot of discussions with Network Rail, we were trying to reach an agreement which would satisfy both parties because this bit in magenta was constraining this bit in here by that amount of space. And with a bit of perseverance and lots of friendly discussions, Network Rail finally agreed that actually, in terms of a passing loop, the passing loop, electrified or otherwise, at Blackford, wouldn't be quite long enough to satisfy what they needed it to do. So they said, actually, you can have that piece of land back. So all we need is a normal interval between the up main line here and the fence line. And beyond that fence line, you can do whatever you want with your giant crane. That gave us three by two stacking. And that was the tick in the box to proceed. And we got the project into the next phase of development um, and get a design properly done that accommodated a track layout for that to be done. But that wasn't really cause for celebration because remember, we still had to fit <laughs> the whole thing in there. That's a, maybe another reminder of the site. It tapers quite drastically towards the west end of the site because the track goes over the bridge over the River Ern, and the River Ern runs alongside the site here, the, the site, so it constrains the, quite, the site quite uh, tightly, the further west you go. So the site narrow, it's bounded by the main line to the north, that's the main line there, the River Ern to the south, only one road access point in here, so east end vehicles in and out, there was only one non-operational road access, rail access point, which was here, it didn't work. It was unable to be made to work. Sorry, take that back. It could be made to work, but it couldn't be made to work for very long because these TVs were still going to cross the level crossing and pounded hell out of the connecting bars. The curve to the west end up in here, Across the river underbridge was a constraint. We couldn't go any further that way. We couldn't come any further to the round, so it is narrow at that end. And the bit in here in the yellow box, that's Panhole's uh, pedestrian crossing. So the dog walkers would take the dogs, walk across a little wooden bridge over there, and go up across here, across the rail line, access the hill area, exercise dogs in every treat. So all of these constraints had to be accommodated somehow. Initially, an early solution for the Panholes Crossing core path was to ask the members of the public and the dogs to go around the end of the siding in the blue dash dot, all the way back along there, and then cross the rail line as normal. So that footpath diversion was proposed and it added on an extra 275 metres to the dog walkers route. That was all very well. And the dog walkers said, well, you know, we're here to walk the dogs and going an extra quarter of a mile isn't really a big issue. That's fine. But that didn't really address any of the issues at the panels level crossing. So this thing in here, this pedestrian work level crossing, which crossed the main line, was of some concern. So when we started investigating how much of a concern it might be, and that's a good picture over there, that's the kind of thing the dog walkers would be presented with. A gate, open the gate, go up to about here, decision point, look left, look right, look left again. Can I cross the railways? I've stopped, I've looked, I've listened, and then I'll proceed across. Modern safety requirements recognise that all crossing of live rail lines needs to consider access for all. So dog walker in a wheelchair dog walker with a limp like me and that any persons with reduced mobility PRM folks need additional time to get across that distance in the railway so the warning time should be greater than the maximum time required once you reach that decision point but when you're at the decision point 
and you're looking towards the west end of the site, the sighting distance for approaching trains is about 450 metres. It's about quarter mile. Beyond that point there in the distance, the line curves away that way and you can't see trains approaching from the south. And you can't really hear them either. So the maximum line speed at this location is 90 miles an hour, 145 kph. And that gives users at this decision point here about 11 seconds warning for trains approaching from the west side. So in the down direction here, train direct, you've got about 11 seconds before when you decide to make the move before the train arrives at your feet. Using the ORR guidelines of walking speed at 1.2 metres per second, that 13 metre distance between the decision points was, yeah, just made, only just. So it's safe, but it could be safer. Conundrum then, two big issues that I've talked about. Those planned train operations involving propelling moves and that big lengthy occupation of Blackford level crossing, well, all that's happening. Could the crossing be closed to road users for about 15 minutes, maybe even longer, while well, that propelling move with Oz Horizon took place and the train was safely in the siding and the level crossing could be opened again for road users? And the dog walkers, how could they be allowed to safely cross the tracks at the west end of the site when there's a, you know, shunt operations and all sorts of stuff going on? So finally, after hours of discussion, debate, deliberation, hours, months, years, the key rail stakeholders were finally persuaded that the safest and most robust solution was to access the freight sidings from new connections at the West End. And that image there shows new connections at the West End. So Perth's up here, Glasgow down here, the plane down here. So trains coming in the down direction go across the crossover on the upline, access the siding from a new connection in the upline. And that's a new hedge shunt for the run round moves at that end. Simple. That's no propelling movements. So everything draws in, local leading. Everything draws out, local leading. Dead simple. And just to showcase what actually can be achieved, that crossover and that connection and the head shunt and that new bit of railway track were designed and constructed by NetRail in a very short turnaround period of only 10 months between March 2018 when it was decided to go and January 2019 when it was commissioned. And that was all funded as part of the freight facilities grant which had been awarded at that stage by Transport Scotland. So big collaboration there between Highland Spring, Transport Scotland, local users, and assisted by the Freight Facilities Grant coming up with that design to, do you know what? A West End connection for this signing is best all round. And as part of that, they also accommodated the dog walkers. Now imagine the delight of the dog walkers, January 2019, Santa's been. Look at that. That tricky problem was solved by more consultation. You see, the ORR guidance makes it clear that decisions about level crossings, pedestrian crossings, should involve rail companies, traffic authorities, other relevant organisations early, early on, as early as possible. And those authorities are encouraged to recognise the wider benefits that safety improvements at level crossings can bring. And if you can replace something with a bridge and it can be funded properly, then how safe is that? There is no issue about people crossing the railway line. So under that consultation framework, Transport Scotland, Network Rail, Perth and Kinross Council, the local dog walkers were all represented and it was agreed that actually we will fund a new footbridge. And that was constructed and installed as part of the January 2019 works while that track position was going on. And I think that's a fantastic achievement. And I don't think we shout loudly enough about what went on there. Very safe now to get from one side of the railway to the other. But the consequence of all that good common sense and consultation and safety application 
was that our original design of the siding layout was completely altered. It was turned inside out, upside down. The east side entry using the existing switches was now no longer. The new switches being provided at the west end, crossover, half connection, head shunt stuff, meant they were to redesign it. <clears throat> no big deal, turn it around about, use a mirror. <clears throat> Excuse me. Unfortunately, it wasn't quite as simple as that because the gradient on the siding has to be considered. Lie the land was the track generally falls towards the west. And we had to make sure that the siding was low enough to rise towards the west to make it's absolutely sure that nothing in the siding was going to run away and affect the main line. And at the east end of the site, well, that seemingly simple idea we had right at the start in 2016 of using existing crossover, all that stuff, that was kind of quietly abandoned. We redesigned it again, and that new head shunt and extended cripple siding uh, was designed in without taking too much of the network rail storage area that is adjacent to the level crossing at Blackford in here. So, moving on, with the track layout finally fixed, construction contracts could finally be let. We let contract for ground survey. We brought in the grid soil, soil stabilisation folks. We erected the noise barrier, and that is one hell of a noise barrier. Painted green, of course, to blend in with the hillside. I think there should have been a splash of purple here and there. And then the concrete crane pad, a rebar to die for. Bear in mind this gantry crane plus container that it's left on off isn't a lightweight piece of equipment. That uh, reinforcement in there is absolutely essential to the safe function of this essential pad that this vehicle is going to run up and down. Some track support was designed and because it was a siding and because of what it was going to hold, we put some mainline limits on the levels of this track support medium. Uh, it was constructed by Ludden to a tolerance of plus nothing, minus 10. And that was a, a really good result to have that, because it meant that with a minimum of fuss, all that needed to happen after that was a sleeper's need to lay the rails put on top and bring on the trains. We had some storage and road contracts let. Again, Ludden did all of this stuff, and that was still how the vehicles coming in to coming in and turn around, offload or load from the rail access in here. And that got us started in proper permanent way engineering. And I know the permanent way diehards on the call, you'll be waiting for this bit. So once we did all that good civil engineering stuff, the track layout could finally be uh, constructed. So the switches you see here are, are sitting at uh, track works yard in Doncaster. Switches are the most complex item. These are initially constructed at manufacturer's premises for a factory acceptance test. Um, and that factory acceptance, test, <coughs> factory acceptance test does the dimensional checks and makes sure that it is safe to operate in uh, normal and reverse positions. And then they strip it down and transport it to site and then rebuild it on site. Simple enough, BVA. However, we had to raise a design close call on this because WSP's design had an issue with it. We specified strengthened BV switches and hand levers, thinking, well, it's a siding. You wouldn't have anything bigger than a BV switch. No need. Very slow speed. BV switches, the strengthened type, according to the REPW drawing, shouldn't be hand operated. Now, the initial thinking behind this as well, since the strengthening involves an additional set of blocks at the front of the switches in the movable area, and the movable area is shortened. And with a shortened movable area, they may be very difficult to pull, and that may lead to personal injury by the person pulling the points. Hence the reason for the note on the drawing that we had missed, saying 
must be operated by point machine. However, that wasn't proven to be the case. We did some testing. We tested the switches with a Henry Williams two-way lever and found that even the lightest of our party, an 18-year-old apprentice, young lady called Leah from Birmingham, was able to pull them with one hand. So we don't know how the note got onto the REPW drawing, but everybody concerned is happy for those points to be hand work points, despite what it says in the REPW drawing. The plain line elements that you see in the picture there being constructed carefully by Story were designed to be as sustainable as possible. Remember back in the original slides that was shown at the start, I mentioned sustainability, environmentally friendliness that uh, Highland Spring had at the core of their operation. Well, we decided to apply some of our own future ready principles and specify um, X main line components, repurposed, reused, recycled. So we wanted reused, recycled concrete sleepers, reused, recycled rails, something that served a lifetime of use in the main line, but which, because of its wear, could still readily cope with slow speed and low annual tonnage in a railway siding. We wanted ballast to be recycled stuff, screened and served to provide a free draining track support bed. It's not going to be running fast trains, it's going to be well compacted, blah, blah. However, good ideas. Material supply is an issue, not was an issue, still is an issue. The markets in recycled railway materials from Network Rail's facility at Whitemoor uh, is almost non-existent in the UK. So the final track form had brand new rails that you see in the picture, all the way from Austria, well done Vostalpine, and freshly crushed print trachyte from Lanarkshire, well done Cloburn, rather than any sustainable alternatives. In addition to the noise barrier that we've seen in the picture, the big green thing, the local residents uh, asked that the track design could be made quiet. And to do that, we specified a CWR. CWR in sidings is a novelty. You won't find many CWR railway sidings, but it gives benefits in that once you've got over the initial capex of welding up every rail joint, and it's not that much extra. You then get a benefit in the amount of joints you have to tighten, none. Inspect, none. And in terms of whole life cost, you could argue that thermic welding of every joint is actually uh, benefits whole life cost. So the process of welding, which you see a thermic weld having been sheared, poured and sheared, that creates continuous welded rail. CWR track form, and the thermal expansion of that is controlled by creating a stress-free temperature in the rails of 27 degrees. That's done using length, existing temperature, and the difference in temperature multiplied by Young's modulus for steel. Above 27 degrees, the rails are in compression with a tendency to buckle. Below 27 degrees, the rails are in tension, and I can tell you there will be a hell of a tension today because it's currently minus seven outside. So they've got 34 degrees worth of contraction or rail tension in those rails if the air temperature is the similar in Blackwood. So we use 27 degrees in the UK because it's at the mid range of rail temperatures in the UK were typically somewhere between around about minus 17 to somewhere around about plus 54. But as we all know, moving forward, temperatures are going to get higher. Winters are going to get milder, although I don't believe that. I haven't been outside today, but that's the theory. The last bit of infrastructure we had to consider was this road level crossing. You would look at it and say, I can see the siding. I can see where the real road vehicles come in and drop their cargo. I can picture the gantry crane lifting containers off and putting them in that little storage area here. But I don't really know what the level crossings were. Well, remember I said uh, the gantry crane was on rubber tires. So the rubber uh, wheels on this thing are steerable. So what they do is they build the gantry crane in this area here. 
they lift it up and then they drive it, I kid you not, across this level crossing and along the crane pad. And once it's on the crane pad, you'll notice there was nothing at all to stop it going that way towards the main line, apart from its very clever guidance mechanism, which uses GPS positioning to make sure that the gantry crane can go up and down and up and down, but not left or right. These uh, rubber panels are sustainable. They're manufactured from recycled rubber tires and bonded together with an advanced polyurethane binder using a revolutionary cold cure manufacturing process. And once they're installed, the rubber panels themselves don't react with soil or water and they don't leach chemicals into the environment or emit any harmful vapours. They just sit there doing their jobs. And they're left in there because once a year, the crane will drive off the crane pad onto this area here and receive a full annual maintenance check and then it'll drive on again. So the level crossing will be left there. As you can see, Rose Hill Rail uh, used to be hold fast level crossing. Nearly finished folks, we're in the home straight now. So this new freight sidings was officially declared open on the last day of the summer this year in August by Scotland's very own First Minister, the Right Honourable Nicola Sturgeon, MSP. The development is a major milestone for the UK's leading producer of natural source waters, and that enables Highland Spring to transport their products sustainably and supports their ambition to be net zero by 2040. And as you can see there, this gantry crane blends in very well with the, sky, with the skyline, sorry. Uh, that's, it's, but it's green. Hang on a minute, it's green. In her speech, the First Minister congratulated all those involved. And I thought, well, thanks very much, Nicola. I'm, I'm glad you like it. As she said, particularly, getting the Highland Spring Rail Freight Facility to the point of opening and operating has been a complex task. And everyone involved should be immensely proud of their achievements. And I was. She said, rail freight is intrinsic to the Scottish economy. It supports the supply chain and serves a broad range of sectors. And it's good for society and it's good for our environment. That's why the Scottish Government invested £4.47 million in this project through a freight facilities grant. And she then said, removing more than 10 million lorry miles from Scotland's roads in the first 10 years of its operation will go a long way to improving the environment and the lives of those close by, as well as helping the country as a whole achieve our net zero targets. And our final part in the shop you should listen to, she said, I am confident that other businesses will now follow suit. And I can report that we've already had an inquiry about moving wood by, from road by rail. That's the end of my presentation. I'll say thank you and I'll take any questions now. Thanks, Tom. I, I don't have any um, questions waiting in the chat at the moment. So um, if anyone's getting any, they can drop in there or we can even just, just go for opening the mics, I think, and just go straight to, to asking if, if anyone's got a question. It's just really you miss me being in the audience because I would have four or five <laughs> questions already that I would want to ask myself. <laughs> uh, well, well, I'm going to jump in then quickly. Um, maybe, Mr. Stab, what was the thinking behind the decision to go with CWR again and the siding? What was the benefits of that? Benefits of CWR and the siding uh, are to do with patrolling and inspection. Highland Spring, and, or the operator of the yard, John G. Russell, uh, they have people who will do the inspection. They will have people who might sling a key over their shoulder and mm -hmm. tighten joints. If you don't have to do that, if all you have to do is have a look at the siding and have a look for buckles and the like, what's CWR on the siding going to present you in terms of inspection and maintenance? It's very low speed. It's going to last forever. It's got concrete sleepers. It's got brand new rails and it's all welded up and stressed. It's yeah. just going to sit there. The maintenance involvement is next to none. John yeah. G. Russell 
that was a big tick in their box. What, you mean I don't, I've got no joints to tighten? Brilliant. Mm. And for Highland Spring, they get the reliability aspect that CWR provides me. You don't have dip joints. You don't yeah. have items to pack. You know, it's, it's just going to sit there. So that was the, yeah. that was the thing about. But the big thinking behind it was the gadunk gadunk, the uh, the joints. <laughs> you know, your freight train going over joint after joint after joint. It crawls in as it does its run round, as it does its draw forward. Residents sitting in the back garden sipping their gin of a quiet summer's evening in Blackford didn't want to hear that. Yeah. So having CWR, they might hear the class sixty six. Local, or actually, maybe not. The late, the new electric local doesn't make a lot of noise at all. So, and once it starts to haul its way south, you don't really hear very much. So, environmental considerations was why we went with CWR, which is why we get involved with the strength of BV switch, which is why we fell full of the design close call rules, and that we missed the potential to cause harm by not specifying a points machine, which, as it turned out, wasn't needed. Needed, yeah, yeah. Good fill, there's hands up. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, we'll, if we'll go around. So, Jim, maybe if you go first, then we'll catch Gordon next. Yeah, oh, oh, okay. A uh, couple of questions, Tom. Uh, firstly, we'll, we'll, we'll say on the subject of uh, points operating equipment, I can I can quite understand uh, that we're in a siding. We don't need uh, complicated points operating equipment. But uh, we, we, we seem to have gone for the Henry Williams two-way levers, which are fine when they're brand new and everything is set up and absolutely tickety-boo, but through through time, they become difficult to operate. Uh, was there any consideration given to going for, for example, the, the, the Raycor type switch stands, which are from um, a personal, a personnel, should I say, point of view, uh, and perhaps health and safety point of view, a lot easier uh, and less strenuous for the operator to operate. We considered uh, two additional, two other options. We considered the Raycor switch stand, and indeed I, I did some trial pulls at Bones just to see what the difference was. And the Raycor switch stands, because the gear mechanism is much easier to throw than the Henry Williams. And I agree with what you say about Henry Williams. Having been involved in the maintenance at Newton Heath Depot and having seen the damage that can be done by a loose cotter pin on the, <laughs> on the Henry Williams lever, I know what that can bring. <laughs> Excuse me. The other consideration was to retrofit the points once they were in with zone green equipment. So that's the, mm. um, that's the power operated hydraulic pack which John G. Russell quite liked the idea of because A, he wasn't going to have to pay for it, and B, his uh, operator could, at one end of the yard, using something like a TV remote control, command and turn the points to be normal or reverse from that distance. So he didn't even have to walk the length of the siding to pull the points over, and he would get a clear indication of the lie of the points. So the zone green retrofit, to the mechanical equipment that the BV comes with was um, priced up. They come in at, I think, £42,000 for the pair was the, the amount that they were going to charge us. Um, and if the points had been difficult to pull, that was where we were going to go. We were going to bypass the American Raycor type stand and we're going to go with the mechanical, the, the, the uh, hydraulic power pack from Zone Green. However, once the, the switches were manufactured at track work, we did some trials there and we discovered that the Henry Williams uh, equipment could pull the switches normal and reverse with one hand with an eight and a half stone young lady who had never pulled switches before. <laughs> so it was obvious that the note had been applied as a super cautious approach by someone who had gone to a BV switch strengthened it with a required number of eight HT bolts on the switch, shortened the stroke and put that note in the drawing as a caution. In actual fact, it didn't need it. So I hope I've answered the question. So we, we did consider other stuff. We did the trials and the proof of the pudding was, do you know what? They're no harder to pull than 
I see nine and a quarter. Yeah, I appreciate I appreciate that, Tom. I it's great when everything's brand new. A couple of years down the line, when uh, I, I think I, th I think we all appreciate that sidings do not necessarily get uh, the care and attention that they really should. Um, that'll be interesting to see. Ma Ken, ma ma yeah, ca carry on. So sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Ca carry on, Tom. I, again, the, the issue of maintenance was, you know, so with the, with the handover to maintenance, the maintainer, John, or the operator, John G. Russell, they've got uh, lots of, in fact, they're, they're looking at Ravenscreek to have more of sidings in the lake. They already have the Dean side facility. They've got more sand. They, are, they have people who know the importance of point oily and making sure that the equipment is still running correctly. But I appreciate what you say, sidings, who's there, who sees it, not very many people, not very many movements a day, but it only takes that one uh, where you've got that, you know, the split pin's fallen out, the pin's dropped off, the points are standing open, and you've got something derailed. And it's that's when the issue happens. So maintenance cannot be understated, but we said the important things to take care of and the points are the lubrication and the monthly inspection. Okay, Tom, I, I know Gordon, I hope, has uh, put his hand up, but perhaps I can I can hog this for a second question. I, m moving to Panhard's level crossing, I, I, I suppose we could call it the Doggers level crossing. Um, great, we've taken away the interface between people and trains, but was there any issues I raised regarding uh, facilities for persons of re reduced mobility. We put a foot bridge in with steps. We used to have a level crossing. To me, you know, we, we, we've moved forward absolutely great because we've taken an interface, a dangerous interface away, but uh, has there been any reaction regards a foot bridge with steps as opposed to a level crossing? In during the consultation period that was raised, but the people involved, I guess, don't have any PRM issues. So therefore, climbing the, the steps of a footbridge, it was like, well, you're going to give us a new footbridge? We'll have that. We'll take that. They didn't consider. We considered. And the consideration for pe people of reduced mobility is to go via the level crossing. It's a far longer route but that's the only way to get to that particular side of the hill is to go the long way around, go actually across the level crossing in Blackford, so go out of the village, across the level crossing, up the road, and then down into the that area of the, the field. There is a route, but the, you could argue if you were a person of reduced mobility, you, would, you could make the case that, hang on a minute, I used to use panels crossing, now I can't use the footbridge, I am... Um, demanding some sort of compensation, I guess, in the litigious society we are, we have today. There's no, there was no suggestion of it ever being fitted with a lift or a ramp or the like. It was simply a footbridge to make sure that the people who walk the dogs could get to the other side of the railway safely, in a safer manner. Okay, thank you, Tom. Okay, Gordon, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, hey, thanks, Tom. Uh, I just wondered, um, do you know whether um, Highland Spring have uh, are, are going to bring in empty bottles or anything like that by rail for use? I don't think they have the facility for recycling uh, empty plastic bottles at their facility. I don't know whether that's in their future plans or not. Uh, it may be that, that that's the case, but at the moment, the containers that arrive at the facility are empty, and there was a daily service now runs between Blackford and Daventry via Moss End that JG Russell operates on behalf of Island Spring. I fully expect that, and as the future goes going forward, that JG Russell will serve not only Highland Spring, but their own customers. There are, if you effectively, what we've created is a container transfer facility near Perth. And it's there for JG Russell to use 
as they have the capacity to use it as their license allows them to. So it's not exclusively a Highland Spring facility, although Highland Spring will use the majority of the capacity of it. Yeah, thanks. Just for um, interesting discussion about the records uh, switch stands there, uh, we put BV8s with Raycar, uh, strengthened BV8s in with Ray, uh, the Raycar switch stands at Waterloo on Aberdeen to Inverurie. Uh, and by all accounts, they uh, you just have to look at them to throw them. Uh, and just a throwaway for everyone else on the call as well, the connection that goes into the uh, facility, um, that connection has been duplicated at Dal Cross uh, at the Norboard factory or the West Fraser factory, I think it's now called, other than the mainline crossover because it's a single line, but the half connection and the head shunt detail at Dal Cross is a, a carbon copy of the one that's been put in at uh, Highland Spring. I like the idea of that recycling designs. We should have standard designs for, to be used wherever we can. Well, did they really recycle it? Because I did the original one, so... <laughs> well, I know. But it's, but it's, but it's you, you've got that learning uh, and, and you, you put it to good use and that's, that's always good. Okay, thanks. Okay, I've got a question in the chat there. I think you might have mentioned this, Tom. It's David's asking, is future track maintenance within the facility under network rail auspices or is it contracted out? There was a, a demarcation plate being put in front of Highland Spring 1 switch, which is the usual arrangement for a private siting. So the maintenance within the siting, beyond the gate effectively, that's where the gate is. So you can, you can actually close a gate across the rails at the siding. Um, and you know, prevent access to the siding. So if, if it was to be secured by somebody, you could close that gate. Beyond the gate, on the railway side of the gate, it belongs to Network Rail. So the half connection to the head shunt at the west end, Network Rail own and maintain that. Network Rail own and maintain the insulated joint immediately in front of Highland Spring 1. And Network Rail own and maintain the BR996 um, Point indicator mechanism that was fitted to Highland Springs HS1 points because it was felt important as part, it was part of the signalling scheme plan that that equipment was fitted to Highland Springs uh, turnout to give the signalling confidence that the route had been set into the facility and the points were made and detected, although there is no points detection on that switch. Okay, thanks. Yep. Yep. Thanks, Tom. Uh, any other questions? All quiet. I'm doing well. That's it. That's, that's, that's normal. <laughs> I'd be asking myself a thousand questions. Oh, let me get a minute. Uh, one, uh, one question for me, Tom. Just the last one. Um, I just wanted to ask was during the operation of the highway lands, Highland Spring, what actually happens um, during the day? I mean, when, when they're working, do they work during the night time with the containers or during the morning? I mean, does that impact the local village at all since having it after being built? I mean, what's what what has the, what difference has that made to the local Blackford um, in terms of the logistics being off road now? There's no lorries going past, I, I believe. I mean, has it made a big, big difference in terms of the impact? Because I'm looking at the sustainability for this. So, I haven't had any feedback from the local residents committee. And the residents of Blackford meet regularly with Highland Spring to discuss issues like this. And that's, you know, all this has been raised for years. You know, the local residents saying to Highland Spring, you're bringing even more lorries in. What are you going to do about it? And that's initially what prompted this whole thing. The situation is now different. As I said, there's now a daily service. Those containers that would normally go uh, by road now go by rail. Um, and they've got the benefit. In terms of the amount of time the facility works, the operation conditions, it's not allowed to work after 2200. It's not allowed to work before 0600. So during the night, nothing, it's silent. The, the yard is operational only during the day. At the moment, that single train that comes in, and they had a train in just the other day as part of the regular service, and somebody timed it. 
and that train was in for an hour and 20 minutes. And then that hour and 20 minutes, 20 containers were offloaded and 20 containers were loaded and it went away again. I mean, that is how rapid the transfer is. If you've got a stockpile sitting there ready to go, the actual transfer on and off the train is very quick. The locomotive, the train itself, isn't in the facility for a long dwell time at all. What then happens after that is the little shuttle vehicle that runs the containers backwards and forwards across the road to Highland Springs premises, it just goes backwards and forwards all day. Another taking an empty in, bringing a loaded one out. The crane is used to stack it on the demurrage area, ready for the next train coming in the next day. Brilliant, Tom. Thank you for that. Tom, uh, Jim, Jim Watson again. I, I'm going to be the nuisance tonight. Good. Uh, you, you, you mentioned uh, you'd had issues uh, obtaining suitable serviceable material. Uh, and I think this is something that is going to occur in future where uh, companies or the Scottish government or, or whoever are planning to put in new sidings. Sidings, yeah, great, let's cascade serviceable material. Uh, sleepers, I know, have been difficult to get, but serviceable rail nowadays, uh, I think it's almost impossible. And some of it is down to uh, track the news techniques in that now we tend to lift out um, plain line and 30, you know, cut it into 30 foot panels rather than 60 foot, uh, loading with road railers rather than with TRMs. But uh, there just does not seem to be cascaded long welded rail which can be turned into uh, short lengths available. Uh, and it's something that I think is 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 an issue. Um, you know, given, so. yeah, yeah, oh. so, sorry, Tom. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's an issue. Uh, trying to keep costs to a minimum and trying to look at recycling the circular economy sustainability. We looked at the embodied carbon in the whole operation, and we said we are. Can we make savings in the embodied carbon, either in the reduction of muck shift, and it's all about the vehicles that are employed, the embodied carbon in that, the embodied carbon in the ballast. Where can we reuse, recycle, repurpose? And that was the future ready mindset we went at this project. When we looked at everything and to do with the track, and the track was the bulk of the, the you know, the, okay, there's a lot of concrete, there's a lot of rebar. But we looked at the track, we thought, well, okay. We are fairly near the main line. There is already a, a siding there for the you know, in possession time. Surely we can take wagons off, you know, we can get wagons off spoil. We could put a power screen commander there, we could recycle. But the problem comes when you try and let that as a contract. So we let it out to the contract. We've got, you know, ABC Rail, they want to come and do XYZ. You know, they are going to the marketplace to see where they can buy the material. When you look for second-hand rail, track work used to have stockpiles of it. They don't hold that anymore. There's no money in that. When we re-rail on the main line, the rail either lies there, getting rustier, or it's cut into 10-foot billets by somebody who nips it through the head with a, a flame gun. Somebody else cracks it. It's gathered together to an access point and away to a scrap merchant somewhere, back into the melting pot. That's the recycling bit that happens. We never think about repurposing rail off the main line, cascading that used to happen onto, you know, rural lines or the like. So when you go to purchase, you know, a thousand metres of rail from somebody, you go to Network Rail, uh, no, it can't be done. I was thinking, OK, all we want you to do is next time you lift CWR off a re-railing site, up north, Aberdeen, anywhere in D north, anywhere north of Blackford, just drop it off in the way past on the upline, pause momentarily, and, and offload some rail strings for us. How difficult would that be? Very impossible. They couldn't do it. It couldn't be done. Never mind the cost of it. It just couldn't be done. We approached several sources to try and make it happen, and it can't be done. 
we managed to get the serviceable F-27 sleepers from a source. But that was, again, that was not easy to do. And so the recycling, we talk a great game about recycling. Recycling ballast, you think of all the entire renewals we do, between 30 and 40% of the material that comes off an entire renewal is crib and shoulder stone. It's never had any load bearing. It's been sitting there, been washed by the rain, brushed by the leaves in the autumn, and there's not a lot wrong with it. And we throw it, we mix it up with the inert material below the sleepers when we take it off site, and we put it in a stockpile somewhere at Kingmoor or Miller Hill or something. We don't screen it, we don't sell it, we don't do anything with it. You can't buy it. It's 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 mixed. It's just landfill because there isn't enough of a market for it. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, maybe 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 the problem is 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 the way that it's uh, marketed, Tom. I it used to be we screen ballast at Miller Hill, we screen ballast at Cadder, I. Uh, but now, with uh, the, the advent of, of network rails, NDS, or I think they're called something different now, but, but with NDS, it all goes down south. We don't screen ballast in Scotland. Uh, and if we did, we'd be shipping it out as a, a type one or a, a road uh, subgrade uh, type material. And of course, the cost is in the transport. We're not doing it within Scotland anymore, right. uh, and that that to me is a a big big disadvantage uh, to encouraging more companies to do what uh, Highland Springs has done and invest in uh, a rail facility. It's the market, Jim. It's the unit cost. Mm -hmm. People look at the cost of the operation. It's like crushing concrete sleepers. You take a concrete sleeper crush it to remove the rebar and the cast iron out of the housings, it costs more for the operation than what you get at the end of it. Therefore, not economically viable. What's not quantified is the embodied carbon you're saving by recycling that product. Every concrete sleeper we lift out the main line, every 284 kilos of concrete sleeper goes to landfill. We used thousands of recycled F-27 sleepers at Blackford, and that was the only win in track recycling that we were able to do. And yet we had, what about the rails? What about the ballast? We couldn't do it because the material went there. Yeah. It just, there's, there's, there's not, the circular economy has yet to come to the railway. Uh, we used yeah, to I, do it. <laughs> absolutely, Tom. Yes, we did used to do it. Uh, and we used to do it very well, but we did recycle a uh, track into sidings or into lower category track uh, up to what uh, the early 2000s uh, we, we, we were cascading uh, CEDAW or long welded rail from the route routes like the West Coast Main Line, East Coast Main Line, Edinburgh, Glasgow, they were going up to uh, Aberdeen, Inverness or wherever and they were being reused there. It doesn't happen anymore. We uh, specified we, in our design, we said nominally 17 metre long rails, second hand, and we were envisaging 60 foot rails with the bolt holes cropped off, welded into strings and made into CWR. Maybe rail that had never been the CWR. Maybe 113 pound rail that had come off a jointed track thing. Mm -hmm. We cropped the, cropped the bent ends off it, weld it together, and there's a siding for you in CWR that lasts a lifetime. Yeah. Uh, it just couldn't be done. We uh, Each of the tenderers that were asked to provide the price for the second hand rail, and all of the tenderers that tendered for the rail part of the project said, we can't get sufficient supplies. We're going to have to go with brand new stuff from Austria. <laughs> but, yep. you know, that, that's the madness of it all. You're getting 18 metre sticks from Austria and it's like well, all the way to Blackford for a five mile an hour siding. You don't have anything local. I mean, you look over the fence at Blackford, there's a great big long string of CWR that they took out the main line. And you think, we could have used that. But it, it just, it's in the too difficult box. Nobody 
there is no Willie Ross scrap recovery guy anymore. There might be end, great NDS, but when NDS are looking for creating a circular economy, they look at the logistics cost of creation and the cost of resale. And if you don't have a regular market for that, you need to store that material. And storage and then resupply is the issue. Yeah. Whereas in the old railway, you knew somebody that was looking for, you would plan a cascade knowing that something was going to happen in the main line next June and you would plan the Lanark branch to be cascaded in August because you were going to use that rail that came off the main line. It was all thought about. There was yeah, no yeah, thinking Tom, anymore. Sadly, we have a long, long way to go. Uh, and what does concern me, you say, looking to the future, uh, Scotland has a lot of really wonderful, really good aspirations uh, as, as far as uh, moving, having this modal shift from road to rail, but it's taking so long. Uh, the gestation period of this specific project has been 10 years. You know, can, can we afford that uh, with, with, with other potential schemes? Can we wait 10 years for this transition to happen? I think the delivery mechanism has to change. I'm not saying the delivery mechanism was particularly bad in this instance. It was just kind of regular, you know, so the things that were stopping it happening tomorrow, you know, next week or next month, it was always something. It was always like miles away. And that that consultation continually. When you come to Network Rail with us, the very first thing you enter is the BAPA and the APA. You're a third party. You're part of the ASPRO organisation. It's not Network Rail's day job. They do renewals. They do projects. Third parties, well, you know, what's in it for Network Rail? Nothing but heartache. And Network Rail do what they would normally do. They want to protect their asset. They want to make sure that the piling that you install, all the track monitoring, yeah, all that's good safety stuff. But it makes it expensive. It puts time on the project. And I don't know if things will change under pace. But there was still a whole, um, well, it was red tape, effectively. It's things that never used to happen on the British Rail that now happen uh, because it gets contractual. It gets safety-related and contractual, and people protect their position, they protect their shareholders, they protect their PI. Oh, this is my opinion, by the way, not the opinion of WSB. It just happens that way. We get involved with... You know, people who find it very easy to say no than say, let me have a think about it and I'll see how I can help. And we need oh. more people who say, let me have a think about it and I'll see how I can help you, rather than people that just say no. Yeah, I'm absolutely, Tom. I say casting my mind back to a project that both you and I were involved in 15 years ago. We were building a new rail freight terminal in Aberdeen. That was outside parties, <laughs> oh, yes. and the hoops, the hoops we had to jump through, we created a new rail freight terminal, which is sitting there unused. Uh, but yet, it was the hoops that we had to jump through because that was under a BAPA. It was terrible. It was, it, it was absolutely grim. You and I experienced that. Uh, it's not the way forward. You, you would think how, how things, the the old signing at Blackford, I mentioned that it was basically for local farmers to take the milk churns and the livestock and get them up to Perth. That's why the siding generally faced north. So coming into Blackford and going out, the, the, the traffic was Blackford to Perth, Perth to Blackford. That's, that's what that crossover and connection did. It was getting local product from you know, 20 miles away from Blackford, gather to Blackford siding and put us up to Perth to the market. But we do wanted to change that to be, you know, a place in Perth that has a global market. And let's face it, Highland Spring has got a global market. It's getting their product from Perthshire to France, Germany, wherever. It goes via Daventry, it goes via Felixstowe, it goes on ships, it goes to your local Tesco. You know, how next time you go into Tesco and you see a bottle of Highland Spring, you think, I wonder how that got here. Yeah, eventually it came on a lorry. But how did it get to where the lorry picked it up? It went on a freight container somewhere. 
from Persia to Moss End, to Daventry, whatever. It came locally, eventually in the last mile. And that's what the whole modal shift is all about, getting the big long distances. And freight has, has got to, there's got to be a resurgence in freight. We are generally not using the railway we used to do for the commute. And maybe Sundays will be the new, uh, you know, Sundays and Mondays will be the new weekends. I don't know, but certainly freight needs to improve. Fast freight, why, why, why do freight trains go so slow? Freight trains going in at sidings. We can't do that with perishables. How does Amazon work? You know, and how does next day delivery happen? How can I get from whatever the distribution centre is in, let's say it's Daventry, it might be uh, somewhere else, but, you know, Hinkley. So let's go get Hinkley to Moss End to Perthshire. To Aberdeen, to Craig Inches, to, to wherever. You know, there are facilities that are there ready to be opened up as freight facilities. We need to think differently about freight. For years and years in this country, the the focus has been on passengers and the passenger focus has all been about journey time, getting from A to B. I'm a passenger and I would just actually like a train to turn up and get me to be at a time that it says it's going to get to be. I'm not interested very much in the actual speed. I just want to get there a decent amount of time. Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 Tom, you, 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 you're, you're, you're absolutely right there. Uh, perhaps the focus has been wrong. Perhaps the focus has been wrongly on, on, on passenger traffic. You mentioned uh, Aberdeen. You mentioned Craig Inches. It's been 12 months since the ASDA train has run from Grangemouth to Craig Inches. I know. It's, are, are, it's... Are, are, we missing, are we missing a trick here? Are we focusing completely wrongly as an industry? Why, why has it been that we've not been running this ASDA train uh, from Grangemouth, as I say, to, to, to Aberdeen, to a brand new siding that was put in 15 years ago? That traffic is all, all going by road. Is it supply and demand? The, the, the traffic's still there, but you're right, Jim, it's going by yeah, road. And tra traffic, the traffic's still there, why, but it's running it? by road. Why is it months. so difficult? Is it is it is it the unload load at, at Craig Inches? Some needs to look at it, and it needs to be something. What you see when you go to your freight haulier, that freight haulier will be very flexible to meet your demand. If you want your container picked up at four o'clock in the morning tomorrow, he'll make sure there's a driver there with a with a truck ready to take it. You can't really do that in the railways, but if you think about the bulk transport and the long distances that railways can travel in a sustainable manner, then having these inland ports, they call them, Hinkley and Daventry and you know the like, most end, is getting the containers to there, getting the goods to there, and then getting the for the last distribution part by road or helicopter in the future maybe. But we need to think about how we get stuff from A to B. And it's not about passengers anymore. And if we can get freight speeded up a bit, and we get fast freight and slow freight, uh, and we get them that mix of it, we can then start to look at... I, I've, I've been landed with a problem this week, and it's to do with network rail on a certain route, and let's call it the Peak District route. No, Peak, yeah, peak District. Um, peak Forest Railway. Duffel was tunnel on the lake. Um, the, the category of track has increased because they put more tonnage at the quarries, because they're quarrying more, they're moving more product by rail. More product by rail, more EMGBDA, means an increase in track category. That increases the inspection and maintenance regime. Actually, technically, you should put an extra 50 mile of ballast under the sleepers to make sure that it lasts longer. But when you increase the volume of freight traffic on a route, then the track category will change. The maintenance regime needs to change in response to that. And yet, because you're running so many freight trains now, you've condensed the engineering hours, the engine hours available for the engineers to maintain and renew the railway. So that, that's a double-edged sword. So we need to think about how can we move the freight trains as normal trains during the day, maybe, without impacting the passenger service too much. Does that mean more freight sidings, more loops, more whatever? We need to think about big picture stuff. And the way the railway's going, where 
it's like working for a widow woman and there's very little money sloshing around there to do any kind of improvements and every renewal is a like for like renewal, then improvements in the room are very difficult to come by. Everybody is sitting watching their purse strings at the moment. Tom, I was going to jump in there. I'm conscious there's another question on the chat as well. Okay, I was going yeah. to ask, um, just from David Lindsay, who's asking, will rate low into the lows into the yard be possible uh, with fully electric traction once uh, the main line, which is SCM4, is wired in the future? Freight traction, electric freight traction, is that is that the question? Yes, yep. Yeah, so electric freight traction would be able to access the siding, but the... Obviously, once they come off the main line, putting wires above where the, the gantry crane is going to work is not going to be viable. So it would have to be some sort of, and we did look at that as part of the initial thing. So do we want the locomotive power just to haul in and disappear? And for the movements within the siding to be done by a, you know, something that looks like a Class 8 shunter? Can we, can we have some sort of local vehicle pushing the wagons around about? Could we shorten the crane pad even more than it is? and just do local movements of the wagons, splitting, joining, all that good stuff, and just have the Class 66 and its very expensive crew arrive and depart, basically. So the train arrives, couples off, disappears away back to depot. Does he have to stay there, do the run round, and haul away again? Is that possible within the driver's day? So we looked at all of that kind of logistic thing. So we all looked at the future and said, well, OK, once the line becomes electrified, will electric trains be able to access the siding? The answer is no, because once you go for gantry crane operation, in fact, even reach stackers, once you go for that containerized uh, impact, the, the wire above the train is the big impediment to getting the container off and on. Mm. So electric trains and gantry cranes are not really compatible. But it's nothing to stop an electric train from going in, provided it is buy mode at some point and switches to battery power to do its in and out the depot. It can do the, you know, 500 miles down to Daventry under electric power and do the one mile around about in the run round under a battery operation. So the new class, what was it in the day, class 89? Somebody will correct me because it'll be wrong. But the new buy mode electric train that uh, DRS have was actually sitting in the siding when Nicola commissioned the facility on the 30th mm -hmm. of August. Yeah. And that bi-mode train was the kind of thing that they were talking about the future of with a train like that, which is generally electrical powered and also has a battery capacity to do the last little bit in and out of the siding where you want containers on and off. And they were thinking about ports and the like. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, excellent. That, that answers the question. I I knew some of the electric locomotives now we had a small diesel engine for the, the last part of the journey. Yeah. Um, but but I, didn't, I didn't realize it was a battery version. That's that's good. Think things will improve as battery technology improves. And I'm looking out at my car that's entirely battery powered. And I'm thinking, oh, it's getting on a bit five year old now. I should be thinking about replacing that battery soon. Do I? Should I? And actually, then I thought, well, the battery technology means. I might get more than 180 miles out of it. New battery, bigger capacity, more kilowatts in it for the same space. Mm. And battery technology is improving, as is hydrogen. So buy more trains will be the way of the future. And we will hit that uh, zero, net zero target in 2035, without a doubt. Yep. Oh, okay, uh, I see that this Jack Skeet's hand up. I was just going to go first to a, a chat question there from Stephen Muirhead, who's asking, um, was the option of a rail-mounted rail mounted overhead crane considered? It was, Stephen. And again, it was discounted because modern technology allows for different ways of doing it. So if you look at Craig Inches, the Craig Inches crane is rail-mounted. It is noisier and it's travelling up and down than the fairly silent operation of the rubber tired version that we have at Blackford. Again, every decibel counted when we were looking at, at Blackford, and I think personally that our noise and vibration experts went a bit overboard with it because of the size <laughs> of the noise and vibration fence, green as it is, it's a huge thing. You know, you, you know I, I'd, be, I'd be struggling to throw a golf ball over the top of it. It's so big. It's, you know, but we did look at various options for the crane. 
we did look at the reach stacker operation that was quickly discounted based on uh, the amount of width that the site had. So when we were looking at the crane, is it going to be rail mounted? Is it going to be road mounted? I didn't even know these. I, I said, how can it be rubber tire rail? We have to build a containment curb. And I was focused on this containment curb to stop the thing driving on the up main line. And they went, nah, 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 we don't, we don't do containment curbs anymore. All controlled by GPS, all fail safe. Can't, can't go wrong. Really? <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm not convinced, but it's there and it's safe and everybody's signed it off and everybody's happy with it. But, you know, to me, it's a, it's a rubber tired vehicle that can steer. Running up and down something without a curb. Excellent. Yeah. All right. Uh, Mr. Scott, would you like to ask your question? Hi, Tom. I'm just, for the sake of correctness, the thing that you've seen at the Blackford handover was DRS's 88, which is electric and diesel. However, there's now plans afoot to introduce another new one, which belongs to somebody else, which will be electric, diesel and battery. So the technology is there to run around the train to do everything you want with it. It's just a case of making sure that locomotive actually gets to Blackford. Thanks, Jack. I wasn't sure what the number was. I, I don't, me and trains don't go on. I've spent a lifetime in the railway dodging them. You know, so I, I don't tend to be anorak enough to look at the train. I knew it was nice, shiny blue, and I knew it was bi mode, and I could see there was a pantograph on it, and I knew it had come into the depot and it was moving around. So that was obviously the diesel engine part of it that was running it around. Yeah, I think it, for the, the latest one that plans to come in, I think at the end of the year shortly, is a 93, they call it, I think, and that's the one that's diesel electric and battery powered. But that might not belong to DRS, of course. I don't know. No, it's whoever is uh, able to afford to buy, buy them, make them. But the technology, you're, you're right, the technology is there. The technology is getting better all the time. I expect, having heard today's announcement on the news, that the next locomotive will be fusion powered. We might all surprised, yep. Any, any further questions from anyone? Anything. Conscious some people might be going to watch a certain uh, World Cup semi final game as well, but no, it doesn't bother me. But some people might be heading off for that. Any last questions at all? No, we're all good. All right. I think um, if we just move on to the vote of thanks, which I, I'll give Tom. Um, Thanks. Excellent presentation. Uh, it was a, a great example, I think, of the variety of topics that can be discussed at PWI. It's great we have a mix of not only technical design-based stuff and talks about site installations, but it's not often we get a presentation like this that talks about a kind of wider principle of moving from, from road to rail. Um, I thought it was really hard to believe, I think others have mentioned it, that it took 10 years from inception to implementation. And I, I think as an industry or even a country, we need to start making that process a lot simpler and faster to encourage this model shift from road to rail for, for other companies as, as we discussed. So it's not always as straightforward as we think though, and I think you explained that very well, the hurdles that, that we're involved in it, is such as how, how any works here would have fit into network rail's aspirations for the area. And also the site constraints, such as, you know, the, the right of way access, pedestrian crossing, the space constraints with given the, the main line and the, the river Ern uh, round about it as well. As, um, there were other line side neighbour considerations for aesthetics as well, which always have to be considered these days. As you pointed out, painting the gantry, crane green to blend in a bit with the surroundings uh, and limiting the stacking height of containers and, and the noise barriers as well. So. Good, great result for the dog walkers and getting the pedestrian rover bridge installed though. Um, and, and then it, again, it's, it's the redesign that was required for moving the entry exit from one side to the other. So there, there always is uh, things, blockers and, and challenges to be overcome. Um, and, and your design close calls you mentioned as well. It, 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 was, it was great to see when you mentioned the service and when material has been specified, I thought that sounds magic. And then you, you, you kind of cut us down again and said, to, um, you know, they weren't, weren't available or was, wasn't possible to, to get them in. And it's 
I think with a few of people discussed it, it's becoming more and more of a problem that, and even even specifying new, um, not serviceable materials, but new sustainable materials such as side cut sleepers and things. It seems to be a, a task, a bit of a challenge to even get rams and other funders etc to go for it um, even though sustainability and net carbon is such a big big deal it's still not you know it's hard to convince people sometimes to to go that way so that that, that was all i was going to say really and it's once again thanks again for an excellent presentation you know with a different perspective from our usual topics and the next bit i'm going to say is always tricky when we're doing it online but if i can ask everyone to come off mute and Enjoy with me and thank Tom for his presentation this evening. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Yeah. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, yeah. Tom. yeah thank so you, Tom. I think this is done really. It was just a, a reminder again that our next meeting is on the 18th of January. Um, it'll be likely to be a hybrid one online and in person. And it, the venue will be to be uh, confirmed, it'll either be WSP or Arcadis offices, but Arcadis are, are moving in January, so um, we'll Hopefully need to see. That's it. Hopefully. Yeah. I mean, it's all barring rail strength. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> the things you've got to consider these days before you arrange an on, uh, a face-to-face uh, -face meeting are unbelievable. Yeah. I'm, I'm coming to your office tomorrow, for example, um, yeah. um, an RIA, RIA meeting. Right, and, okay. uh, and that'll be it. it's interesting for me to get there. I think I can get there midday and kind of last train home back at four o'clock. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they stop at six, I think, tomorrow, don't uh, they? Mad, yeah. absolutely mad. Non strike day, stop at six. <laughs> absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, you can stop recording now, Angus. Can you? I think he's fell asleep. I <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't know if we can because it's, it's oh, not right. as, not as that. Uh, it says in my screen, Greg, for the last five minutes that you've got five minutes left in your meeting. So I'm assuming it's on some sort of automatic shutdown. Yeah, I think it's only the organizer that can stop the recording. So we just tend to stop the call once we're we're done, and that's it. It'll get once edited we, for YouTube. Once we start swearing, swearing, drinking. <laughs> it probably says, you know, when they start it, it finishes at quarter past seven or something, you know. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's an automatic process, and if you're talking beyond that, tough, you know. <laughs> I mean, I mentioned this earlier. This was the, the learning outcomes for the transportation students up at the GCU. So this was, so I had to sanitise them. So the bits in red and the bits that are struck through and added in red are the bits where I had to make it a bit more railway-centric. <laughs> Because I was talking about traffic lights and traffic calming and, you know, highway engineers and DRMB, which is the Design Road something, something handbook. I don't know. It's a yeah, crazy thing. And that's what, that's what they're teaching our students in the universities these days. So I was glad of the opportunity to go up to GCU on behalf of the PWI and you know, just remind the students that there is there are careers in rail because I think we really need to do think as well as all the stuff we talked about tonight in the future. Think about the engineers of the future. Who are they going to be? And don't ask any of them at work weekends. <laughs> Hold your tongue, Mister Wilson. They don't work weekends. <laughs> they don't work weekends. I know. Uh, but <laughs> it's that kind of thing. So I thought I'd just share that with you since we're all playing anyway. Of course, as We've got this wonderful thing up here called the Rail Systems Alliance. We have access to wonderful amounts of serviceable CWR, but they just walk away and leave it. Maybe we should be talking to Alec Sharkey to say, would you like to recover some of that for future projects and stick it aside in some way that we can get it out and put it on the train? I, I don't think it's as quite as easy as that, Jack. I think it's all it's all got to go back down south, which is the madness yeah, think, of it, you know. Well, it's, when it's, the relationship is it should go back to Whitemoor, but that's only because it's another part of the network there that decides that. Mm. Well, they talked, to, I don't know if anybody caught the track engineering conference that was online last week, Never Rail's annual track engineering thing. So the guy from Whitemoor was there and he said, well, last year we managed to recover six s and c units. And I thought, six? <laughs> In a whole year, yeah. and and that, and that's the extent of. He said we could have done better. Yes, yes, absolutely, you could have. 
you know, and, and the statistics are small. Oh. See, we are to uh, Tom. If you go back, if you allowed to get a cab ride down the west coast, there's miles of the ruddy stuff that's just not been recovered. I thought and it was third no rail, Jack. Is it no third and fourth rail? Is there no one in the session, one in the fourth foot? Oh, there's about half a dozen things in some places, you know, but it's just too much hassle to do it, you know. I know, and that's why when you look at it, and I I go up and down the West Coast, I'll look at the window and I see miles and miles of rail that's been taken out of the track and left. And I was thinking, well, for Blackford, you know, all we want is, you know, an empty seat. Do they have CWR trains, LWR trains anymore? Something to lift it and drop it off at Perth? How hard could that be? I think the problem is they don't have real CWR trains now. They've got a discharge train that discharges rails, but it's not capable of recovering it because they've done away with that process. Oh, that's the issue then, and that's the issue. The industry needs to go and solve again and get it back to the ability to recover the rail that you took out and take it somewhere else. Even if it is all the way back to a melting pot somewhere, you need to be able to recover it in a significant length and not in stupid three metre lengths. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for us up here, the obvious place is Muller Hill, where the trains start out of. Mm-hmm. You would Stick think. Back in there and put it back on a train, but you need the means of recovering the ruddy stuff at the moment, which they can't do. Correct. So that's what needs to be solved. So, you know, when the RIA talk about innovation in the railway, it's actually not innovation, it's re innovating machinery that used to exist on the railway. Uh, be it a roll along wagon or some sort of CWR recovery train to actually go up and tidy up and do the network because I'm, sh- I'm sure the CWR train that they took off, they just took off the power cars and left it as rail carrying wagons. I'm sure the power cars are lying around in the side and somewhere, but they've probably been they get- run for years, you know. How did they discharge in a very not very controlled manner, I would think? No, it's quite, uh, rather Heath Robinson compared Aye. to what the high that I see that we are trained. What did they do? Strangle wrap it and drive the train away from it? Is that how it that's happens? That's basically how they do it, eh? Aye, that's what I thought. So that kind of whole thing, you know, people in the industry know that and people in the industry don't do anything about that. And when they're looking for innovation in the industry, actually what we in the industry should be shouting about is, I never mind the innovation, let's just go back to the way we were and do it safer and with a better end result. Absolutely. You know, one of my little ploys when I used to work for the plant organisation was commissioning serial we are trains. And they do an excellent job, but somebody's just defined to bin it, you know. know. Which is sad, because they spent millions of pounds creating it, and now they don't use it. i got to go, folks, so I I need to disappear and and, uh, be somewhere else. Uh, Part of my duties as driver in this dark and cold weather. I've got a gig at half seven, which is Dad's taxi. So <laughs> uh, I'm going <laughs> to love you, love you and leave you. And yeah. uh, I look forward to seeing you again in the new year. Have a good Christmas. And you, yep. Tom. Same yourself, Tom. Yep, thanks. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Right. Bye for now. Thank, thank, thank you, yeah. Tom. It, it's been good having a, a discussion with you. Uh, but the last thing I will throw in is Jarvis and Slinger Train. Why? Aye, Jarvis. I remember Jack yeah. Jarvis. He, remember he, 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 SDRC, <laughs> Slinger Train, yeah. I know. And it is, it's that kind of thing where, you know, things that were invented by the past by Naki people who had a vision and it was made to happen. And everybody said, oh, that's a great idea. Or that machine's fantastic. And then all of a sudden we get privatised and the money men come in and there's no oh, there's no no product in it. There's no point in that. Why do you want to keep the track in good condition? Let's just let it fall apart. You know, we, we've adopted a a kind of throwaway society attitude to the re, to the rail industry. We look at a, you know, I, I marvel that the sleepers at Blackford, they were F-27s. I could read the date on them. Oh, by the way, if you don't know how to get the date off an F-27, you just rub a piece of chalk along the housing and I'll tell you it's made by Lay's and it was made in 1974 or whatever. So that's the date. So looked at some of them. Those sleepers were some of the sleepers I put in in the late 70s and 80s. And here they are. I meet them again in a different guise. And I can tell I was actually on the site when they were put in because I can read my handwriting on the cant marker that's still on it. 
or at least Bobby Nick's handwriting. So, <laughs> <laughs> so these sleepers were at one point East Coast, West Coast, wherever. They're now finding a new home at Blackford in a siding. And it's good to see that 1974, 50-year-old sleeper is now finding a new life supporting the freight trains at Blackford. And that is the a genuine, you get that circular economy moment where you think, ah, hello, old friend, I've seen you before <laughs> on a dark Saturday night somewhere. And now we meet again in the, in the cold, harsh light of daylight at Blackford. But that's what circular economy is all about. And that's where we need to go with the repurpose, recycling, sustainability stuff heading towards net zero. We need to use more of what we've already got out there. If we could find a way of taking all of that crib and shoulder stone and have it up in the air for a moment while we do the dig underneath and then put it back down as bottom stone, wouldn't that be a great thing? We would have 40% less stone needed to be quarried Carted to site, you know, well, you could calculate that embodied carbon saving. And as Jim and I know, even when you calculate the embodied carbon savings, nobody really wants to listen. Mm. However, right, I've done, I'm, I'm going to be late for my gig. Right, okay, so catch you later. Have a good one, Tom. Bye for now. Yeah, cheers, cheers, guys. Um, cheers.